Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? We're going to start our debate. I want to say hello to everybody. My name is Robert Tomaszewski. I'm senior analyst at Politica Insight, the platform delivering everyday uh, business intelligence analysis covering also Polish politics. And since last week, I have a great privilege to be part of the team PI Climate Special Service, which is covering all the things happening during COP24. Uh, if you haven't registered on it, just do it right now. It's totally for free. Uh, and it's bilingual also in, also in English. Today, I think uh, that we have very symbolic moments. We, um, we celebrate today on Silesia uh, the Barburkas Day. So the day of Saint Barbara, the patron of every miner. It means that no mine here in Poland is digging coal today. Uh, we have also, uh, and miners are singing songs and celebrating, having a holiday. At the same time, uh, around a kilometer from here, there is uh, the most important event from the perspective of global uh, climate negotiations, the summit COP24 happening in Katowice. So I think that these two dimensions, this, this coal dimension, this uh, Barburka dimension, and dimension of the uh, climate summit are meeting here uh, together, leaving us with a question how we should transform our economies, how we should transform our energy systems to not leave behind those people who depend on fossil fuels. And uh, I first want to uh, ask uh, Commissioner Sefcovic to deliver keynote speech of this debate. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Th thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. At first, I really would like to apologize for the sound of my voice. It's uh, because uh, I had, I think, too many speaking engagements over the last two days, so I hope that uh, you will hear me well. If not, in the end, I will come to the sign language so we can communicate in, in that way. My second point would be that I would really like to <clears throat> congratulate you on a very cool place you established here. I very much like the atmosphere, environment, and the fact that Bar is in a close proximity, so I'm sure that it allows for really very good uh, brainstorming going on <laughs> among all Greenpeace activists and their guests. <laughs> now, the, the discussion we started uh, yesterday, I think it's uh, uh, very important because of the topic because of the place and also because of uh, the timing. And as you know how important this is uh, for the European Union because uh, I'm absolutely convinced that if it comes to the climate policies, uh, now the world expects uh, that Europe uh, would assume the leadership and would really lead the world to the climate neutral future. As you know, in Paris uh, three years ago, and I'm sure that uh, many of you took place uh, in the discussion there, it was a kind of a unique moment. I mean, after many years, I got the feeling that uh, the mankind decided to do the right thing. And after many difficult years of tough negotiations, uh, we decided to pull in one direction. But of course, very often to take the commitment, it's a little bit easier than to really fulfill it, to implement it, to transform it into the reality. And therefore, we are meeting today, now, here at uh, COP24 in Poland. The, the issue is how to make sure that the commitments undertaken into, uh, in, in Paris would be translated into the real life, will be transposed uh, into the real deeds which would change the reality on the ground. This is what the negotiations uh, are about. They are called single rule book, actions for the future, uh, monitoring, transparency, and all these very important words. But what it is really about is how we would make sure the commitments undertaken uh, three years ago would really form and shape the future, especially for your generation. So what we did in Europe in the meantime. I am proud to say that uh, we are the first major economy which uh, transposed our commitments in Paris into binding laws. So there is no doubt that our 
commitment which we undertaken in Paris to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 20, uh, uh, in 2030 by 40 percent would be overachieved. Thanks to the ambitious policies of our member states and, and our European Parliament, uh, as you know, we aimed higher if it comes uh, to the renewables by 2030, but also for energy efficiency than the proposals which have been put initially on the table. Thanks to higher ambition in the area of renewables and energy efficiency, already today it's clear that by 2030 we would reduce the greenhouse gas emission by at least 45 percent. And I personally believe the direction would be even higher because uh, I'm sure that by 2030 we would have uh, more than 35 million electric cars on our roads. I'm sure that we would have many more energy efficient buildings in our cities and that also our industry would be much more energy efficient than it is uh, today. So what this means for the future? You can say that if you are going to overachieve in 2030 and reduce the greenhouse gas emission by more than 45 percent that we should be quite happy because definitely we would do the most, we would be the most ambitious, so we should be just quite, quite pleased with ourselves. But uh, the case is uh, totally different, and I think that you know the answer to what is the challenge of today. That even with all these policies put together, we still would be somewhere at minus 60% in 2050. And what the latest uh, UN report, the IPCC, told us is that if we just follow even this very ambitious European path, it's still not enough. We still would have overheating of our planet and we would uh, end up in uh, the situation of no uh, point of return, irreversibility, drastic changes uh, to the weather patterns, many more uh, weather-related disasters all over the world. So it's quite clear that uh, what we need is to look over the horizon and start thinking already now how our planet should look in 2050, how our economies should be adjusted to this uh, new challenge to be climate neutral in the second half of the century. And this is exactly what we did uh, in uh, Europe, this is uh, exactly what we put on the table at first of European leaders, but yesterday I presented uh, that uh, strategy to the global leaders because the choice is clear. We can do it. With today's technology, we can actually become climate neutral by 2050. But it requires very clear industrial choices. It requires uh, more investment. It requires uh, close uh, cooperation with our public, with our citizens, because uh, nothing would happen without public support. Nothing would happen without people changing a little bit their the, the lifestyles. So it must be real collective effort. So this is the proposition we've made to Europe, to the world. And now we want to have real open discussion about the several scenarios we presented. And we want to use these two years of discussion for making sure that by 2020 we will deliver, again, in full accordance with our Paris commitment, very clear, detailed plan how we would make Europe first major economy which would be climate neutral. If it comes to the topic which is, of course, uh, very important for Poland. It's very important for 41 regions across the Europe, for 13 member states, for 240,000 people who are working in the coal mines. Let's uh, agree that these are difficult times for them. They've been at the forefront of the last industrial revol revolution, and now they are getting more and more messages that carbon is simply very carbon intensive fuel, that we have alternatives which are cleaner, which are cheaper, which are much better for human health, which are much more important if you want to live uh, in cleaner 
cities and breathe uh, clean air. And uh, therefore they are looking at the current uh, transition with a lot of anxiety. What this transition means for my city, what it means uh, for my region, what it means for my family, because we've been for generations working in the coal mines. Does it mean that we have no future? And I think here we have to be extremely, extremely empathetic. And we have to have very clear answer that the, our common goal is to make sure that no one, no region, no single person is left behind. That we are ready to work with these regions on the conversion of these regions into future oriented, forward looking into the regions where this new economy will grow, that we have a good answers how to do that, that we are ready to offer our vision how we can transform these regions, that we are ready to work with local authorities of uh, sets of uh, projects which would make this new reality uh, possible, and that together, Europe, member states, region, private investors, we are ready to look for the financing of these projects so we can start to work on them already right now. This is what the call platform for uh, uh, this call regions in transition is uh, all about. We came up with that idea a year ago when I had very emotional discussion with the local parliamentarians here in Katowice. I came here to present our energy and climate policies and and I went uh, to the regional parliament. And of course, I was expecting a rather dynamic and a little bit tense discussion. And I was very surprised to hear from local leaders telling me, Commissioner, we have to cooperate with, with you much more closely than until now. We are afraid that if we want to transform, if we want to bring new economy to our region, that young people would leave our cities and our villages because they are worried that the environment is not good enough uh, for their children, that they suffer from respiratory diseases. They think that the investors would avoid these regions and that uh, the brighter economic future will be waiting for them somewhere else. And we do not want that. We want young families to stay here and we want that the young families to have a very clear vision that uh, their economic future is here at home, that we can actually develop the economy, which would be attractive for the young people to stay. And that was for me a very clear signal that we have to really look together for the solutions and for the answers of the future. What can we do to bring, as I said, expertise, knowledge, and really channel uh, the, the European funds and private in investment into the direction of making sure that this region would be cleaner and cleaner they would be oriented uh, into the future and the new economy will have a strong chance in this part of Europe and in other coal region which decides to cooperate closer with uh, the European Commission. Maybe the last word I would say because it's uh, the last item on my to-do list to make sure that by the end of my mandate I can say that if it comes to the energy union mission is accomplished. That everything what I promised we would do in the strategy on the energy union which we adopted in February of uh, 2015 is fulfilled. And that my last worry on my mind is uh, legislation concerning clean mobility. What I'm talking about are emission standards for cars, vans, trucks and buses. And here, let's be honest, we have to do a little bit of catching up because number one producer of air electric cars and electric buses is not the United States, it's not Europe, it's China. If you are looking where our car manufacturers are thinking to get their batteries from when finally they start to produce uh, electric cars in Europe, they are again looking into the Asia. And this is something what we have to see as our utmost priority. If Europe is today producing the best cars on this planet, our next ambition should be that we will produce the best cars 
on this planet, which at the same time would be the cleanest one as well. And then we would be able not only to manufacture the cars, but also to produce the green batteries which would power these cars and which would be compatible part of a new electricity design which we are negotiating right now and it would become part of our energy system which are modernized and which are really in tune with the renewables, with energy efficiency and with all the new technological developments we see uh, developing in our labs uh, all over across the Europe. The last point I would say because I see that I'm talking predominantly to the, to the young generation. I think that uh, your task is very, very crucial. We see how difficult the discussions sometimes uh, are. If you are talking about climate change and a healthier planet, everybody immediately agrees. When we are talking about uh, rising a little bit price of diesel, you could see what kind of demonstration you might get in uh, such a pro-climate uh, policies countries like France. So it's very much about uh, communication, about the explanation, about advocacy of uh, our uh, green policies for the future. What does it mean? How important it is? And, and it's also about uh, your activities and your energy to bring not only the good people uh, to the European institutions, but also to make that outreach to the wider public about the uh, importance of these policies, about the life choices we have to do, and about making sure that the, the planet will be safe also for the generation of uh, your children. I would conclude by saying, which I uh, think I heard at the last uh, COP meeting from uh, uh, the native uh, Indians delegation from uh, uh, United States, who said that, you know, we just have to remember that uh, planet is not ours, it's just uh, borrowed from our children. And if you would uh, adopt all the decisions and if we would maintain the policies with this in mind, I'm sure we would do a lot of more clever choices in the future. Thank you very much for your kind of invitation and thank you very much to bring me to this cool place. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And now I would like to invite Annabella Rosenberg, Program Director of Greenpeace International, to deliver her speech. Thank you. Uh, oh, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much. I know I was supposed to stand up, but we are cozy here. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I was just listening to Commissioner Sevcovic. I was also thinking on the last time I came to Katowice. Um, and I was glad to see one of I mean, those that were responsible for me coming a couple of times to Katowice right there um, and seeing very many, very many fellows from the labor movement uh, here in this room right now um, because I'm in a Greenpeace impersonation but I, I'm new to this family um, and I work for a long time for the labor movement so it's so nice to see a blend of those two communities here to listen to you. Why is that? Because I think we've all been following um, with lots of attention your announcements, the idea of the long-term strategy. Um, and first, allow me to thank you for coming here. I mean, it takes a lot of courage for any politician uh, to come here to these kind of spaces where you can't really control what we are going to tell you or ask you. Uh, and, um, and that says a lot about your openness and your willingness to, to talk to us. So that's really cool. And I think I would also like to thank people in the room um, that made time, but in particular those who are from this region. Um, the hub is also an, a door to people in the Katowice region to come and engage with us on climate. Um, it's in English. I mean, our Polish skills are not very good, I guess. Uh, but, but I would also like to welcome them uh, into the climate hub. You said it, um, this is the time for action. Um, and we're still struggling to find it. I mean, the, the actual action that is going to deliver the vision that um, you explained um, a little bit early. Um, we, I mean, I was trying to challenge a bit myself on this idea that we should always criticize the vision of someone else and say, let's assume we believe in that vision. Let's pick the most ambitious scenario 
in the long-term strategy, even I would say a little bit more ambitious, so that is 2040, and we are in line with the IPCC um, 1.5. So, but let's bank that. And I guess for me, it's about how, how we make it happen now. I mean, how we start tractioning into that scenario. And I was thinking and inviting you to a more, um, to an imagination um, exercise. Uh, and it's about imagining we are in 2040, because as you said, things were so well and so fast that we decarbonized Europe in 2040, that we managed to get free of coal in 2030 because this was going great. Um, and not only that, that basically um, the EU today in 2040 is prosperous, has creating a massive amount of good quality jobs, that inequalities, because wages have increased, inequalities are as down there as ever in European history. So let's imagine that we made it. And we are in 2040 and we are just so happy and proud of everything that, the, um, uh, that Europe has done. And people are trying to say, well, how we got there. So researchers are starting to dig in the past and trying to find out how, how we made it, how this started. And Commissioner Sefcovic might be at that time, people say, oh, this is one of the ones that um, thought about this vision. Um, but he's basically too old, or basically not with us anymore in 2040, um, to tell us uh, what, how he made it, or what was the idea. And they started to look in, like, in the news, uh, in different policy papers, what happened around 2018, 2019 that launched this transformation. And when they start doing this research, they say, hmm, this is very weird. Because every signal we say and we read in 2018 is actually going in the opposite direction. We have a terrible energy policy that is not going for 100% renewable energy grid, still relying on fossil and nuclear. We have a mobility policy that is still highly reliant on international, internal combustion engine and not thinking mobility. We are still thinking cars and buses and road and, I would say, flights and less rail. We are disinvesting from that. We have agricultural policy that's still pushing for the most industrialized version uh, of agriculture and not moving into a plant-based ecological um, agricultural system. On the social side, what we see, I mean, looking from 2014 into 2018 is races, I mean, basically inequalities raising, unemployment, precarious work, the regulation, loss of public services, the absence of the state, fascism going up. So researchers are crazy and saying, what, what, what happened there? I mean, like, how is it that we made it in 2040 if 2018 is just going in the opposite direction? And I think this gives you a sense of our anxiety here because it's not about criticizing just because we like it. It's really about trying to find a way to make real the ambition in today's terms. And this is also because we need to start giving people a sense of where we're going together, but in the short run. And, and we know, I mean, we, need a, we know we need a target. I mean, we need a vision, but we need a short-term target in order to start walking in that direction. We need investments to go to the regions that need it. And for that, we need to give a clear signal that the past is the past and the future needs to come in and, and we need to start putting the money where we want to see it more and removing it from the things we don't like. So we need to start working honestly and seriously on removing um, subsidies to trends in the economy that we don't like. And we also need states to start intervening much more in the economy. I mean, I get your point on China, but trade policies are not going in the direction of supporting an economy in Europe that is, I mean, with those jobs and with that sustainability right now. So the good thing is that we are not in 2014. We are in 2018. I'm sitting with Commissioner Isercovic right now as he's going to tell me how we are going to make it in the next five years in this particular Europe in which we are. How we are going to make it? Because that's what I would like to see. How we make that just transition possible for all those workers and communities. How much money we are going to put there. How we are bringing the investments into those regions. How we are bringing people into these projects. The money, the governance. 
how we are making them taking a part in that project. But also, when do we put the fossil fuel uh, phase out target? When do we change the cap? When do we change our trade policy? When do we start moving the pieces so that the 2040 vision, because I believe it's 2040, <laughs> it happens sooner rather than later? How we do it? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, you know, you would be surprised that uh, if this would be a written statement, I will sign it, you know, <laughs> because I, 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 I agree with you. And, uh, of course, I totally understand that uh, you would like to know what we do next, and I will, I will, I will tell you what uh, currently we are doing, what we are planning to do in the next two years. But, of course, uh, I think it's, a, again, we are speaking about uh, China a lot, so I think the philosopher said that, all uh, you know, long way start with the with the with the first uh, first step. So I think we have to have that uh, vision on the horizon. And you can, uh, I can tell you that when uh, the European Commission presented uh, the first idea about the decarbonisation of economy and decarbonisation of transport for 2050 in 2011, at that time that was a document which the document of the European Commission. The even member states didn't want to discuss it. For industry, it was seen as something which was, uh, which was the reason for a big concern because it would destroy European competitiveness. So that was just uh, you know, a few, few years ago. So that's uh, the fact that today we are discussing about 2050, that we have half of the member states who wants to be carbon neutral, climate neutral by second half of the century, is I think very, very positive sign. But coming to the concrete measures, what what, we, what are we going to do right now? So the first very concrete step is that by the end of this year, so how much time do we have? It's uh, 27 days. So by the end of this year, uh, we had an agreement with the member states that we will get uh, the draft national energy and climate plans. What are they? These are the plans where the member states should do their homework to answer exactly the question you just uh, put on the table how my energy mix would look like in 2030, how I'm going uh, to push for cleaner mobility, what we are going to do with our energy inefficient building stock and increase energy efficiency and reduce energy poverty, what kind of trends we are going to support in research and innovation and what we are going to do with the skills of the young generation to prepare them better for the future. This is what uh, we put into our governance uh, uh, law and this is what the member states are obliged to do and uh, I hope that in December, in January, we will get the plans for our member states so you can debate them publicly in every member state. If this is something what you, other NGOs, parliamentarians, social partners think it's the right direction for every single member state. And what we, of course, uh, would do is to be in very strong interaction with our member states, with our expertise advice, and of course making sure that uh, these national strategies would be compatible with our European goals and would be compatible uh, with the plans of other regions. The governance and these national energy climate plans is also our recipe how to make sure that we would not have a member states which would be on climate holidays or they would be climate free riders in the next decade because uh, of course we are now in much more complicated world than we've been with our 2020 goals because some of the goals are binding, some of them are non-binding, some of them are for member states but uh, some of them are European wide so we have to uh, invent the system and come up uh, with uh, the governance which is really in line with uh, what legal frameworks allows us to do. So this would be the task also for Greenpeace, for NGOs, to be very active and studying what is in these national energy and climate plans and to drive the public debate in every single member state if it's ambitious enough, if it's good for the country and if it's good for, for Europe and, and for the world. So that's something what is very, very concrete. Concerning the money, we put on the table a few months ago the proposal for the next seven years budget. I mean, we have nice Brussels word for it, multi-annual financial perspective. I'm talking about 1,200 billion euros for seven years. 
and uh, we put in that proposal as an obligation at least 25% of climate mainstreaming. So I'm talking about 320 billion euros allocated for the next seven years, which should go for the support of policies, projects, measures, which are climate related. And uh, if it comes to research and innovation, which would be the biggest uh, uh, publicly supported and publicly funded research and innovation program of a uh, value of 100 billion euros, there 35% of uh, that, so 35 billion would go for research, for energy storage, for renewables, for smart grids, for really making our innovators uh, ahead of the curve and bringing us the innovations we need uh, to be successful in uh, this climate change. On top of it, we change the way how the European Investment Bank is, is, is operating. So another example is that just until the end of this decade, so in the next two years, we want to channel more than 40 billions of euros into Africa. Again, for mitigation and adaptation, where we want, uh, under this new European African partnership, to actually demonstrate that European technologies like microgrids, solar panels, can help to improve the situation on the ground. That you can have rural communities who can have electricity and clean water, and you don't have to build the huge power plants and pull the cables for the thousands of kilometers across the desert because today's technology allows you to do that. It's possible and you can really improve uh, the life of the people directly in rural areas in Africa on the ground. So this is just the, the, the few examples uh, uh, what is happening, what is uh, uh, going on. But I think what is very important, and this is, I would say, the, the lifestyle. Here we need, and I'm very, you know, Hopeful because I, I have uh, three children, 28, 26 daughters, and 19 year old son, and I know their approach to environment. I know how climate friendly they are, how strong they are about sharing, about uh, uh, making sure that they do responsible choices. So I think that the change of the lifestyle the millennials brought into the discussions, I think, would be very important because uh, now it's me, uh, my replacement. Uh, uh, would be uh, millennial very, very soon. And I think that this is what, is what I see on the middle management in the companies. This is what I see in, in the political parties, that this new approach uh, to life would be very important for driving also political choices of the future. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, you you want to add something? Lots, but I'm sure, I mean, okay. there, there okay. are so, there's so many skilled and knowledgeable people in the room that I would yeah. like to give them the opportunity. Okay, so I have a question to you, Commissioner. Uh, I want to just uh, bring you a little bit closer to place where we sit, to the, to the country where we are in. Uh, yesterday, President Duda said something like this, and I will use quotation. Using your own natural resources, coal in the case of Poland and making them the basis of your energy security does not contradict climate protection. We have a situation when last week European Commission published a draft strategy till 2050 recommending strongly that we have get uh, zero carbon neutral till that moment. The same moment Polish government published its draft for uh, policy energy saying that Around 2040, the coal will be still significant fuel in Polish energy mix. And I want to ask you, is there any common ground between Poland and our situation now? And this is what is happening here, and this is what is happening in developed economies, that they are transforming their energy systems. Thank you. I'm just looking that there is a chivas written on this glass, but as you can see, we have... We have water only, <laughs> but uh, about, <laughs> absolutely, no, we, we, uh, unfortunately we don't have it either, you know. It's uh, uh, concerning the, the, the statement uh, of, uh, of the president yesterday. Of course, uh, this just shows how the uh, situation is, is complex and uh, very often complicated, because if it comes uh, to the energy mix, again, here the sovereignty is with the, with the member states, and I can tell you that uh, today uh, 
I got uh, the question from one journalist, what, is the, what was the main challenge in, uh, in, my, in my job over the last four years, and I said that the main challenge was that if it comes to uh, energy policies, the national reflexes are extremely strong. And uh, therefore, we have to kind of uh, factor all this uh, in. And I think that the discussion which I just described, which I had here a, a year ago with the elected representatives of this region was, was, very, was very clear one. And I think that uh, it would not be only the energy question, but the health questions, air pollution questions, the livability of our cities, which would really uh, uh, drive uh, uh, the change. Uh, this, uh, Silesia just adopted, uh, I understand, a new measure for the next year concerning the heating that certain uh, most polluting fuels would be banned and uh, uh, that uh, the new solution should be, should be found. So that's uh, the, the way um, in, in progress. And if it comes uh, to coal, I think that uh, the statistics over the last few years, and I would say all the projections I came across with, all the projections clearly show that the coal would be used less and less, depending on how the economies are developed, what is the, the structure and the energy mix, but would be used less and less. So it would be economically more and more complicated. And I think that uh, uh, we shouldn't just wait for that time to arrive. Therefore, we came with a strategy to invest in the new jobs, in a, in a, in a new uh, economies already today. And uh, if it comes to, to coal, I cannot imagine that the coal would play uh, such an important role in that period of time without some super efficient carbon capture and storage uh, technology which would simply make sure that uh, the emissions uh, are not released uh, into the atmosphere. Technologies like this exist. I saw some of the uh, small demonstration in your uh, research institute in Zabrze. But the, the question is, can we scale them up would it be economically viable? Would it be um, economically efficient? And these are the questions which the researchers would have uh, to give us the, 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 the answers for. So I think that the people's will, health, planet state, and uh, the, the health issues would really drive uh, that uh, effort to really uh, make sure that we would live in much healthier environment in 2040 than we are living in right now. Yes, please. It's, um, it's of course, a long debate, but probably what I would like to say is there is, of course, um, you ask what was the common ground between European institutions, in this case the Commission and the Polish government. What I would like to bring is, is there a common ground between the Europe of peoples and Polish people? And there is. And that common ground is that we care for each other. And we care for Polish people and we care in what their future is going to look like. And we care about what Silesia is going to look like in the future and not only Silesia where we are, but other regions in Poland and in Europe that need to face that transformation. That being said, it's not responsible to get people trapped into the past. And the role of our leaders in European institutions and in the Polish government but it, comes, it goes also to Germany and to other countries that are facing this situation. I'm thinking also about Slovakia and what just happened a couple of days ago with the Novaki 12 and like, gladly now they are released. But again, I mean, it's about raising the ambition of many um, European countries. I think from our perspective, what we need is to give them the future and ensuring that every euro of taxpayers' money that makes the EU budget is going to people and not for more corporate capture. I mean, that is basically um, what, in many cases, investments in clean tech sort of means. I mean, we want the money to go to those regions, to go to those people, to go to those communities. And it's very important that we engage with the people at first, I would say, rather than always using the corporates that use them as shields for preventing action. So, probably we have a lot in common with the Polish people. Thank you. And <laughs> Commissioner, almost a year ago, European Commission, it will, it will be on 11th December, uh, a year, launched platform for coal regions in transition. 
initiative to help all those regions around Europe um, to transform from, uh, from coal, like Silesia. I want to ask you uh, where we are with it, and uh, do you think that this initiative is the right one to, to make this transformation faster? And if you're not afraid that this initiative can be, for example, hijacked by coal companies just to make the transformation slower. As I was uh, explaining in my introductory remarks, the, the idea for the coal platform actually came here from Katowice after that very emotional debate we had uh, with the uh, local representatives. And where we are, I think from the beginning I was insisting that if you want to have a success with this coal platform, we have to keep it simple. What I mean by simple? The first thing is that we can work only with the regions which want to work with us. It's very difficult to, to impose you know, help on somebody who doesn't want it. So currently we have the coal regions from seven member states uh, working uh, with the European Commission. What, what is uh, the, the usual way to proceed? We come to the region and if they want, we present uh, our modeling study. We used our joint research center, our economic modelers, uh, to look at all the strengths, weaknesses, and overall situation of the region. What could be the next big thing economic-wise for the region? What, what, what this region would need to, to become modern, cleaner, future-oriented uh, region? We present that study, and, uh, and if... Uh, we see that there is an agreement uh, uh, how this region should look like in the future. Then we ask uh, for projects. Bring us the projects which would make this vision into a reality. Once we have that project on the table and uh, we agree that, yeah, this is the set of projects we want to uh, finance, we want to, we want to support, then we are looking together for the money. So where we are uh, right now, I think that uh, Silesia, Shlonsk, uh, uh, Czech Republic are uh, most advanced in uh, selection of these projects already. I just spoke uh, this afternoon to Minister Kwiecinski about uh, the need of uh, not only the cooperation but the agreement about the priorities concerning these projects on the uh, on the uh, regional and, and the national level and uh, we will have uh, the discussion about uh, this project I believe still uh, before the uh, end of this year and uh, once this is the case so then we start to look for the money together what is uh, paradoxically the best and easier source of money I mean at this stage it's a current European budget because uh, we started, unfortunately, because of delayed uh, budget negotiations, later to spend the current seven years budget. So our experts in the Commission can quite precisely tell you which of the budget lines you are not going to be able to spend because you are behind the schedule, because of uh, certain legal delays, and, uh, and you have a choice. Will you reallocate, reprogram, the money or you are going to risk that you would lose them because you will not be able to spend it. So that's my pitch I'm making to all these uh, seven member states. Uh, don't believe uh, what uh, sometimes your services are telling you that you will be able to spend it until the last euro because uh, I am around uh, this EU offer is long enough to see that each seventh year we have a huge panic in most of the cohesion countries how to spend the money because uh, the, the spending was going behind the schedule. So here, there is a lot of possibilities. Just, just one figure I'll give you. We have a big budget line for smart specialization. There is still, if I remember correctly, more than 30 billion euros, which are not spent from the current uh, budget, and which could be reprogrammed uh, for the project in, in this region. But it requires the, the courage, vision also from the regional ministers to tell to this or that minister, no, I don't trust that you can spend this money. We are reallocating it because we want to support this uh, innovative, future-oriented project in, in the coal region. So this is where we are. 
as I said, uh, uh, Poland, Czech Republic are most advanced. Slovakia is a little bit uh, uh, on the third place. And then we have uh, other countries we join later where we are going through the phase of uh, the economic uh, perspective and then uh, the projects which would underpin it. Commissioner, uh, I, I want to ask you like, specifically about one part of the just transition. Uh, a few days before COP24 happening in Katowice, our biggest trading union in Poland, Solidarność, uh, put a statement declaring that uh, just transition is too expensive for Poland and we cannot afford it. Like replacing jobs in coal mines, uh, the price for it is too high, so we just should stop it. I want to ask you, how, how, how explain this concept to, to trading unions, to, to people who are working in the, 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 those sec sectors um, shutting down, uh, that just transition is not a threat? You know, I, it's, uh, I would say, the same preoccupation, the same concern everyone. It's the same in my country. It's uh, in Laos, it's uh, in Brandenburg, Germany, where I was uh, a month ago, and it's exactly the, the same question, that anxiety uh, about the future, anxiety about the affordability, anxiety about uh, that, okay, if uh, I will get a new job, will I get the same salary for it? And, and these are uh, very fair questions, and therefore I think it's very important to come to this region and, and, and talk to the, uh, to the coal miners and, uh, and, and talk to their representatives that uh, uh, what we want for them is not some, something which is worse, but something what is better. And that uh, we are ready to definitely work with them about these new economic models, about the, uh, the new economic future, which will be important for them, but definitely for their children. And of course, if it comes, uh, the question of the cost of, uh, of the transition. We could be very technocratic and discuss, you know, how much, uh, uh, what is the percentage we invest into the new energy systems, and I will tell you that it's around 2% of the GDP per year, and if we include, uh, you know, this future-oriented transitional project, so it would be only 0.8% GDP more, but the people will ask you, okay, but how it would look like here in, uh, in my region, and for that we have to have uh, good answers, and we have to uh, really work with them to show that they shouldn't be afraid about the future, because the costs, which are very difficult to put uh, on uh, the balance sheet, cost of health, can we put the price on premature death uh, of, uh, of, 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 of our people? Can we, can we put the price on the children being sick uh, because of uh, the respiratory disease? Can we, can we put the price uh, on uh, the pollution in the region which might prevent the other investors to, to come over here. So there are all these factors which are very difficult to put the price tag on, but you know they exist. But I know that most convincing uh, for these people would be to be as precise as we could be about uh, the landscape uh, of the future, what kind of concrete projects we might have, what kind of concrete investment we can bring in, and how we are going to retrain the people or how we are going to uh, provide the social assistance to, to those who, let's say, wouldn't be in a position to be reskilled. Thank you, Commissioner. And I want to give a voice to the audience. I believe that we have uh, here Mrs. Monserrat uh, from ITAC. And I would like to ask uh, for, for a little comments from the perspective of the trading unions. Um, thank you. I'm Montserrat Mir from the ETUC, European Trade Union Confederation, uh, confederal uh, responsible for energy and climate and sustainable development. Thank you, Annabella. Good to see you again. And thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I must say that uh, I was listening with, with attention what you have said. And once again, I think that the, the European Trade Union Confederation have anticipated the debate because uh, we have been in Katowice in 2016 as part of our project, Industrial Regions and uh, Climate Change and Energy and, and how we can support. The idea was how we can support the regions that will be impacted and affected by the, by the, the process, uh, the transformation process. And we have listened to our workers, including miners, 
And they were waiting solutions and they were expecting that this Europe that always we say that the Europe that cares and protects the citizens, they, they, they were thinking also about them, no? And for that, uh, I think that now it's very important that we are here and the conclusions of this, this project that was very interesting because we have visited different regions in Europe, not only Katowice, we have visited Asturias in Spain, Lulea in Sweden, uh, York in, in UK, was everywhere when we have been talking on the floor with workers, they say we are not against of this transition, but we want hope, we want solutions, we want a job, and we want that our families have a similar level of life that we are enjoying with this uh, job that we know that is polluter, that uh, is not very good for the health of our members. And that means that once again, the trade union movement have anticipated, and after that arrives the platform that we welcome very much. The platform that we were in Strasbourg the day that we was launched, you cannot be there, I remember, it was a big problem, a big problem, but we were there. And after that, we are also in contact with the workers. We continue being what the, with the workers and they are continuous asking the same. What's next? Which concrete policies, which concrete support we can have to do this transformation? No? And for that reason, uh, I must say that I welcome very much, we as the ETUC welcome very much the job that you have done with the strategy that was launched recently. We have been also in a meeting with you, because I think for the first time the social dimension appears. And regarding other commissions and other initiatives, uh, I must say that we are happy that for once uh, the, the, the people is in the center also of the policies. For that reason, uh, I'm happy to be with you and I'm happy to continue working with you, Annabella. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to ask you if you have any uh, more questions, um, Commissioner, so it's the, the right moment to, to ask it. Hi, uh, thank you, Commissioner. I'm Alp from the University of Warwick. Um, I think when you look at the EU's ambition overall, it's very impressive, and the policies that are being put forward are fantastic, but I think the... Pro I, I, I think, you know, very briefly, because yeah. Commissioner needs okay. to go on a plane, yes. I just got a signal from organizers, so okay. if you can just ask very the, briefly. Uh, when you look at the member states' ambitions themselves, you've got Nordic countries with 60-70% renewables and then people like uh, countries like Poland aiming for 12-15%. Firstly, how would you bridge this gap so that all countries are heading towards the same direction? And secondly, um, taking away the legally binding targets for 2030, how do you think that will um, affect the reaching of the ambitions? Thank you. And Commissioner, very briefly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. It's, uh, of course, a very, very relevant one. And uh, I think that uh, if you look at uh, these different energy mix, of course, it has a lot to do uh, with the history, but also with, with the nature. So the Nordic countries are blessed uh, with the hydropower, and they've really been extremely smart uh, uh, to use them in, in very, uh, to use it in a very, very clever way. And, and we are very thankful to have them in the European Union because they're bringing uh, this always positive spirit, uh, uh, the drive for the innovations and really the, 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 the most advanced uh, technologies to be, to be used and they are very fast in implementing them. Concerning the different nature of uh, the, the obligations and uh, uh, the way how to tackle them, I think what is very important is that if you look uh, uh, for 2030, so we have a clear obligation for all of us uh, to cut uh, the emissions by, by 40%. And this, uh, and here I'm talking about the, uh, the sectors which are called by emission trading scheme. So then I can say it's relatively easy because the sectors are covered by the ETS and uh, the companies in this sector would have to buy the allowances which we, which we would reduce year by year in a way which would bring us to this uh, uh, mines, uh, um, uh, mines uh, 44% because it's a bit of a different calculation. So, so that will be done 
through the ETS. And then we had, of course, uh, the, the ambition to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission from so-called non-ETS sector. Here we are talking about transport, here we are talking about the buildings, and here we are talking about the agriculture. And, and here again we have already the, the concluded discussion about so-called effort-sharing decision where it is prescribed for each member state uh, how much they have to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from, from this sector by 2030. So you have a legal obligation there uh, as well. And uh, therefore, finally, we managed to convince our member states that we have to be much more ambitious uh, on the transport sector because it's a source of uh, one quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions and not much reform, not much cleaning up uh, what was done in that sector and therefore we are now catching up the Chinese if it comes to, for example, electromobility. So here you have uh, legal obligations and if it comes to the areas like renewables, there we have a, a, a target for the EU as a whole but we have a lot of markers in uh, that system which would not allow you um, um, to go below certain levels. You have upward uh, revision clauses every three years and you will have these national energy and climate plans where you, can where you have clearly indicate how you are going uh, uh, to develop in this particular sector. So I think that our system is uh, quite comprehensive and I am uh, pretty sure that all the targets I described to you, we will fulfill them and I think that as we see uh, in uh, the greenhouse gas reduction uh, perspective for 2030, we would even overachieve it because uh, Member States have been even more ambitious uh, than uh, three years ago and more ambitious than the initial proposal which was on the table. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and we have to stop here because of the schedule and Annabella please and we don't say never say goodbye like saying of course we agree we, we will say goodbye uh, what I would like to say is goodbye with two things one is that the European model shows what I, I see as the European model shows that innovation is always much higher under constraints <laughs> and not just free-flowing uh, innovation and I think we need to encourage the leaders, but we also need to kick the laggards because we have only 144 months to go if we want to stick to 1.5. Uh, the clock is ticking. We, need a, we have a trajectory, so we hope from our politicians to kick the laggards. And this is not only applicable to governments. It's mainly for corporates because that's also a space where the EU institutions can be very effective. And the second one, I started saying that this was the time for action. This is a time for action for people as well. And it's not only an individual action, it's also collective action. And we are going to see it more and more because this is the time where people stand up for their future and for the future of their kids. And I just do hope that Europe will remain that space where we can still protest and raise our voices and say our truths protected by the law and protected by our institutions because the time for protest is only starting and I truly hope that our leaders will have to acknowledge the role civil society plays in raising those voices of protest here in Europe and across the world because that time the time for rebellion is coming thank you very much thank you commissioner Thank you very much. And I have an offer to all of you, because unfortunately, the uh, Commissioner needs to leave, but we still have a couple of minutes. If you would like to continue discussion, I'm, I'm sure that our lovely... Uh,